Well, how is everybody today? I'm glad to see some of you who haven't uh, been in the studio but have been watching things on KUHT or on TV. Uh, some of my students who were supposed to be in the studio evidently watched it on TV. <laughs> but uh, uh, you're better looking than I expected. Uh, I'm probably better looking on TV than I am in person, but we'll go ahead and do what we're supposed to do in this class, which is discuss an ethical issue, hopefully with you contributing as much as possible from your own experience and from your own thought in the light of our study of Christian ethics. One of the things I need to talk about in the beginning is is to kind of sum up the relationship between Christian love and social policy because that's basically what we're focusing on today. You'll notice that I did not have a complete session on sexual ethics. Now, that would have been important to do, but at the same time, a great many people are under, under the impression that the only important thing about sexual ethics is, uh, about Christian ethics, is to talk about sex. And sex is just one small part of Christian ethics. In fact, many times in the history of the church, the church has majored in speaking out on sexual ethics and has ignored other things. For instance, uh, a lot of us grew up in a country where in church you could go to church and you would hear the preacher talking about sexual ethics, that is, talking about things that adolescents may be guilty of, but you would never hear a sermon against racism, or you would never hear a sermon against the uh, mistreatment or the, um, uh, the forgetfulness of the poor. And uh, that is a major gap in the history of Christian ethics in America. And so what I want to do this morning is to talk about the, actually it's this afternoon now, isn't it? is to talk about one area of social policy, which I am very interested in because I have uh, had relationships with lots of people who have been caught up in the criminal justice system. And our criminal justice system is one of the most neglected areas of social thought. Uh, People just don't pay much attention to it, except that a great many people uh, are interested in having a criminal justice system because they're assuming that uh, everybody out there but me and my family are kind of criminal, and so we need to keep them off the street. Well, one of the things that the criminal justice system is supposed to do is to, cre is to keep people off the street who are going to be harmful to their families or to other people in the community. But quite often, if that's the only way we look at the criminal justice system, then uh, we overlook, because we don't actually look into, a great deal of injustice that continues to go on in the criminal justice system. Injustice that has to do with, with racial preferences or economic preferences. Uh, you're certainly better off in the American criminal justice system if you are wealthy. And uh, you're generally better off if you are a uh, middle class family. And uh, that, that doesn't necessarily hold true. Sometimes middle class people and wealthy people are convicted and spend prison time. But um, they certainly have a running start at, uh, at protecting themselves from the criminal justice system. On the other hand, even people like this sometimes get caught up in the criminal justice system when they're innocent. And uh, a great many people who are not wealthy are caught up in the criminal justice system when they're innocent. And so one of the things that I think we ought to focus on if we have uh, been aroused to take part in ethical thinking and ethical discussion is our criminal justice system. Now let me read something from your book, from your Ramsey book, about the whole relationship between Christian love and social policy. Christian love, as we said, is the basic theme of Christian ethics. And your paper was supposed to have shown me that you have thought about what Christian love means in the Christian context. And uh, 
and there are several issues, in fact, a great many issues. Social ethics deals with almost every question. That if you were if you were working on your scrapbook, for instance, you should have noticed that every Houston Chronicle or every newspaper or every news uh, magazine that comes out is just filled with ethical issues because most social issues are ethical issues. And that's what I meant by emphasizing that in Christianity, Christian ethics is basically social ethics. If Christianity may be spoken of as a religion, in some measure seeking a social ethic, then what is the nature of the relationships which come to exist between Christian love and any of its adopted social policies? There's no place you can go into the Bible and uh, get rules on a criminal justice system. There's no place you can go in the Bible to get rules on a number of very important modern ethical issues. There's no discussion in the Bible of democracy. There's no discussion in the Bible of how you should vote or whether you should vote. There's no discussion of the Bible, in, in other words, of most of the issues that face a particular culture or a particular nation at any particular time. There are strategies in the Bible. In attempting to answer the question of how Christian ethics should be related to various social policies, it should first be pointed out that throughout this book, frequent reference has been made to the connection between the ethics of love and specific types of regulation which Christian love sometimes accepts. The main point has been that while Christian love cannot get along without seeking to find from any source the best possible social ethic, such love remains dominant and free in any partnership it enters. Now, he makes reference to the fact that there are certain types of re regulation which Christian love sometimes accepts. That's true of, uh, of Jewish ethics. That's true of Christian ethics. If you look in the Old Testament, there are some regulations which, uh, which even the Old Testament accepts that are not really on the cutting, le cutting edge of love. For instance, most of us have heard the Old Testament idea, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Well, sometimes we misunderstand that because we think of it as a primitive, cruel ethic. And uh, probably in terms of our modern sensibilities, which, which have actually been produced or at least contributed to by the sensibilities of Jesus and, and early Christianity, uh, we wouldn't speak in these terms today, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But what we need to understand is that in the beginning, that was, an that was a very advanced social ethic. In other words, it was a limiting ethic. It limited what you could do to people if you didn't like them or if you didn't like what they did. Before an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, what was the law? What was the general law? Well, if somebody knocked your tooth out, you could take their head off. In other words, an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth is actually a, a uh, less cruel limitation of vengeance or revenge and so it was really an extremely important uh, development in the history of ethics. It's certainly better to have an ethic which is an eye for an eye and tooth for tooth than the ethic that most human beings have if they're left by themselves because most human beings seek for vengeance, most human beings seek for uh, getting two pounds of blood for every pound that they've lost. And uh, that is the reason why ethics, uh, in its relationship to law, both in the Old and the New Testament, is primarily a limiting ethic. It's hard to, it's hard to legalize love. It's hard to force people to love people by law. But you can, by law, keep people from knocking your head off. <laughs> You can, uh, at least you can make it illegal for them to do so, and so they will have to pay for it in some way. So law and punishment is also related in history, and the idea of punishment in Christian love is a very uh, uneasy marriage. But uh, it's still something that has to be worked out in every generation. One of the things that I like to 
bring out is that in our modern American criminal justice system, many of the laws and punishment do not even come up to the law of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. In other words, we sometimes think of ourselves as modern and up-to-date and uh, sensitive and ethical and so forth, and yet we still have people in American prisons who are spending 15 years to life for doing something that does not <laughs> deserve 15 years to life. So that means that we have in our prison system people who are not even being treated by the basic rule of, of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. A woman, for instance, who is caught with a few ounces of marijuana, like some of the women that have been, that were uh, pardoned by, uh, by Clinton, whatever you think of all of his pardons, there were still some women pardoned by Clinton who should have been pardoned because uh, their boyfriends had them carry something. And their boyfriends uh, got off pretty light. But since they were the ones that were, were caught with it, they were given 15 years to life based on the mandatory sentences uh, that are sometimes called the Rockefeller laws and other kinds of mandatory sentences. And uh, I think that's one point where uh, Christian ethics or even a sensitive humanistic ethic uh, should um, do some work, and that is on the idea of mandatory sentences and the idea that there are, some, that there are many people in American jails. Uh, there are many people who are innocent. There has to be a certain percentage who are innocent, and we need to focus on trying to make sure that those people are given a fair shake. But there are also some people who are not particularly innocent, but who have been given sentences which are not uh, fair. For example, the distinction was made between the strategy of Christian love, which remains unaltered, and what, and what such love sometimes does as a matter of tactics. And usually social policy, like we're discussing whether we should have mandatory sentences, that's a tactic. Uh, the tactics that um, people who are ethical, however, use should be based somehow in the strategy, in the basic ethical strategy from which they're working. And if you're working from the perspective of the strategy of Christian love, then, uh, then condemning someone to an unfair sentence is a breach of your strategy. Your strategy should be to uh, love people in such a way that even if they are put off the streets, or, or if they are gotten off the streets, it should be for something that deserves being gotten off the streets for. Uh, there, are other there are other tactics that you can use. There are tactics you can use which help, uh, for instance, a lot of these women were, uh, are mothers. There are tactics that can help you uh, get that family back together and, and help them with their uh, addictions if they have any. And, uh, and so a, a, a large number of tragedies having to do with our criminal justice system can be avoided if we understand that all of these are tactics, and they may not be fair tactics. They may not be tactics which are rooted in a conception of love or justice or rehabilitation. The latter, that is tactics, may be variable and indeed should vary directly and promptly with the neighbor's needs and with the actual conditions for being of some real benefit to them. That's what we hope that our criminal justice system is for, is to be of benefit to people. Benefit both to people who are in danger from the actions of certain people, but also of benefit to the people who, uh, through some act of their own, have gotten crossways with the law and with society. And uh, they need to face that and take responsibility for that, but there are lots of tactics you can use to help them take responsibility for it which does not necessarily include 15 years to life. It does not necessarily include necessarily, uh, in fact, any uh, prison time at all. It may include some supervised uh, uh, treatment. It may include um, uh, some treatment with uh, marital counseling. It may uh, involve some treatment with, with personal counseling. It may involve some treatment for alcoholism or for addiction or something else that uh, is certainly going to be more, more beneficial to both the person and to society than just locking someone up 
and putting him together with people who have spent years learning how to be criminals and uh, putting them in a place where they're going to be abused and they're not, they're not going to be treated like human beings. So by the time they get out, then you really do have a criminal who has been educated by our own institutions to be criminal. This may not be in every respect an apt analogy, but our reference to strategy and tactics suggests at least this much of truth. Christian love ought never to be identified with or permanently bound to any particular program or stipulation for action, however important. Yet no one ever did a Christian deed from Christian love alone without some reasonable, realistic decision about what specifically should be done. Very few wars have been won by those whose tactics were not subject to constant re-examination and readjustment. None have been won by strategy alone. So, uh, in reference to our subject of uh, the criminal justice system, there, there are several there are several sayings in the modern in our modern world which are not nearly as profound or as advanced as a law an eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth one of them is lock them up and throw away the key well, what does that mean well you have the right to lock somebody up if you have made sure that uh, locking someone up is actually advantageous to society and to the person who's being locked up but you don't have the right just to lock somebody up because they have done something wrong. They need to, uh, each, uh, each situation uh, and the, whole, the situation of the whole community and the situation of the whole nation should be kept in mind. Now let me just talk a little bit about one issue in, modern, uh, in the modern criminal justice system. To, and to show you how the Bible sometimes can be related to a particular issue. One very uh, emotional issue these days is the issue of capital punishment. And almost everybody has a very strong perspective on capital punishment. And I'm not going to tell you what your perspective on capital punishment should be, but I am going to suggest that just because you have a strong uh, view of capital punishment doesn't mean you've thought 10 seconds about it. Or, or it doesn't mean that you've actually examined the subject of capital punishment, examined the rights of victims, examined the rights of uh, per perpetrators, examined the rights of society, and examined everything from the perspective of justice, much less Christian love. Um, and so uh, it, it's very difficult these days to talk about uh, to talk about. Uh, capital punishment because we had a long period in American history where, where crime just kind of shot up. And uh, we knew we weren't going to, uh, we, were, we knew we weren't going to give all murderers capital punishment because very few murderers are given capital punishment. Uh, but we thought we, we would at least get a few of them, <laughs> especially those that, uh, that are guilty of heinous crimes. And uh, that is a natural feeling, particularly if you are in a family who has suffered from the result of someone uh, committing the act of murder. But on the other hand, uh, as citizens, we can't just turn this thing over to somebody else with a law and not come back and re-examine it under the light of different circumstances. For instance, uh, one of those circumstances is that we have learned through scientific study that uh, that some people get um, get capital punishment uh, uh, at a at a more advanced rate if they are of a certain race, or certain people get more capital punishment if they're a certain gender, or some people get more capital punishment if they're a certain economic status or a certain class status. Well, that's something that should be taken into consideration when you consider the continuation of capital punishment. Not only that, but just in the last few years, 79 people on death row in the United States have been, have been proven innocent, which is not what we're supposed to have to do in America. We're supposed to have to prove that someone is guilty. Even in the Old Testament, 
this law that's supposed to be old and out of fashion. No one could be uh, sentenced to capital punishment without the definite uh, testimony of two witnesses. Well, we have people all over the death row who, uh, who have been uh, condemned without any witnesses. And we also have people who have condemned, been condemned with witnesses and the witnesses turn out to have been uh, paid or tortured or in some other way given false testimony. And so the people who should be in prison are the witnesses, <laughs> are the people who, uh, who did the torturing or something like that. Uh, and if there are 79 people who have been proven by DNA or by other kinds of evidence uh, to uh, have probably not committed the crime, then you know that there are others who have the bad luck of not being able to be uh, shown to be innocent by DNA or some other way. So that's another instance we need to take into consideration. Well, generally, people who call themselves Christians have uh, fallen back on the Bible as the justification for capital punishment because there is, there is no doubt that there is capital punishment in the Bible, that is, in the Old Testament scriptures. Um, but let me read you a list of the Old Testament scriptures of what in the Old Testament scriptures is, uh, is worthy of capital punishment. We know that murder has always been considered by most cultures to be a crime in which blood has been shed. And so if you have shed innocent blood, then you have forfeited your own life. You forfeited your own blood. And so generally in almost every culture. Uh, murder is a capital offense. Uh, but in most cultures, murder is a capital offense in a very consistent way. That is, um, if you're guilty of murder, uh, you are given a capital offense and you're not uh, put in jail with, with five or ten other people who are guilty of murder and they haven't been given a capital offense or they haven't been given, given a capital punishment. But let me list some of the other things in the Old Testament which require capital punishment. Murder, adultery, incest, bestiality. We won't have to ask you to raise your hand. Homosexual activity, premarital sex in women, because they're the only ones that can be proved uh, at, in the marriage, at the marriage ceremony, whether they, whether they have uh, had sex or not. Rape, perjury, kidnapping, uh, sex, the sex by a priest's daughter, being a witch, being an astrologer, being a medium, being a wizard. Just look at all the people on television these days that... <laughs> <laughs> that would have been uh, sentenced to capital punishment under this law. Not only those who are mediums and wizards, but people who go to them are considered uh, uh, to deserve capital punishment. Hitting or cursing a parent, that would clean up our juvenile delinquency, wouldn't it? Do I? That's right. It would be straightened up. Yeah. One of the interesting studies done last year, by the way, we've, we've talked in this course some about abortion. One of the interesting studies last year is that abortion, the aborting of several million uh, fetuses over the last few years, has actually contributed to a large extent in lowering the crime rate. And so some people are worried uh, that that will be used one way or another in the argument about abortion. That is, if we can lower our crime rate by aborting all of these uh, fetuses, then uh, that, makes that makes abortion a uh, boon to our society or our culture. Um, but anyway, the same thing would be true, as you say, if we had capital punishment for kids that hit their parents and cursed their parents. We would have very little juvenile delinquency in America. And that which would be juvenile delinquency would be largely attributable to uh, some kind of mental illness or something. Pressure button. The people don't realize that the, when the abortion rate goes up, the suicide rate goes up too because a lot of women can't deal with the fact that they actually murdered an innocent baby. 
And that's research that's been proven that the suicide rate does actually go up when they... Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a kind of research which, uh, which uh, people may or may not disagree with, but at the same time it's research that has not been focused on at all in the American uh, discussion of abortion. And so that's the kind of thing we're talking about. We need to get the information. We need some wisdom uh, out of the situation in order to understand how to react to it ethically. Well, let me continue the list. Disobedience to parents. You don't even have to hit them. <laughs> you just disobey them. Blasphemy. Working on the Sabbath day. False prophesying. In other words, if you, if you have a preacher who's not telling the truth, he needs to be cap, have capital punishment. Well, we'd lose lots of preachers. In. Sacrifice to false gods. Human sacrifice. Well, that's a good one. To. Converting someone to a false god or to a cult. Refusing the decision of a court. Treason. Eating blood. Sex during a woman's period. <laughs> Eating fat from a bird offering. Burning some offering but failing to bring it to the sanctuary. Coming near to the tabernacle while it's being taken down. Coming near the priest while they're offering sacrifices. Marrying a... Um, we've already talked about incest, but there are two uh, death penalty cases in the Old Testament which would have meant that Abraham and Jacob would have been given the death penalty. One was marrying your sister's, your wife's sister. Of course, that's what Jacob did. And Abraham went even further. He married his half-sister. So you can see that during the period even of the Old Testament, there are changes in the way uh, justice is considered to be applied. And a great many of the reasons for, uh, for the death penalty in the Old Testament, there are you know, lots of them, and a great many of them have to do with religious practices. And uh, some of them have to do with, uh, with uh, practices having to do with uncleanness, like the reason why a man and his wife would be given capital punishment for having sex during, the, during her period is because she is unclean ritually at that time. Um, the reason why uh, uh, people would be given capital punishment for getting too near the tabernacle or too near the offering of the priest is because of the ritual nature of it. But uh, what I'm trying to point out is that is that Christians may want to go back to the Old Testament to justify capital punishment, but they, very, they need to do it very delicately. And they also need to do it in the light of what maybe the New Testament says about it. The New Testament doesn't say anything about capital punishment as far as Christians are concerned. Uh, the only thing the New Testament says about capital punishment is that it tells the story of some people who should have had capital punishment. One of them, the only, the only relationship, the only discussion Jesus had about capital punishment was in what story? You remember the story? The woman that was caught in adultery. In other words, uh, still at the time of Jesus, a woman caught in adultery uh, would have been stoned to death. So a woman is brought to Jesus and, and uh, the, the people that brought her were trying to trap him into being illegal or being opposed to the law. And so he got around this by simply riding on the ground and uh, everybody that was around the woman just kind of turned around and slowly disappeared because he said whoever, who, whoever is without uh, sin, you cast the first stone. Well, that may not be a statement that determines forever whether there should be capital punishment, but it certainly is a statement about what Jesus felt about the application of capital punishment in certain instances. You also need to understand that uh, the only capital punishment the New Testament talks about are the capital punishment of innocent people. For instance, Stephen, the first Christian martyr. 
James, the apostle. Uh, and the New Testament doesn't talk about this, but uh, uh, these, these other two, the, the, the execution of Paul and the execution of Peter took place. That, that was capital punishment that took place in the New Testament times. Uh, Christians, as Christians, are, do not have the opportunity to be involved in executing capital punishment because they are a counterculture group that has no power whatever. It's only after Constantine uh, makes Christianity a, a uh, state religion that Christians are even put into a situation where they can uh, administer capital punishment. And when Christians uh, were put into that situation, some of them started administering capital punishment and it has continued since then. But of course, the chief example of capital punishment in the New Testament was the death of Jesus. That was a capital punishment. Uh, another example having to do with capital punishment in the New Testament is that there is one executioner spoken of in the New Testament. That is a, a man who was actually an executor of capital punishment. Do you remember who that was? Well, the man I'm thinking about is one of the best known people in the New Testament. Paul. Paul. In other words, uh, uh, if you want to know the name of a man who was in charge of capital punishment in the New Testament, it was Saul. And after he became a Christian, he considered all of his executions to be murder. So there are all kinds of things that are in both the Old and the New Testament that have to be taken in consideration. And as, as you can see, these things are sometimes in tension. Uh, even, when, even when Christians quit um, executing people for adultery and for other things like this, they still maintain that murder was kind of a universal uh, event that uh, might deserve the death penalty. And so a great many uh, Christians today, Christian ethicists today, agree that the death penalty for murder is a, might be a just uh, penalty, all things being equal. But a great many Christian ethicists today believe that all things ain't equal. And so it needs to be, in fact, uh, the... Uh, uh, several churches, including the Roman Catholic Church, which is the largest uh, single denomination, has reversed itself on capital punishment just in this century. And so now uh, the Roman Catholic Church attempts, the Pope, in fact, personally attempts to uh, uh, try to persuade people not to give capital punishment. He, in fact, uh, I was, it kind of surprised me, but he actually sent a letter trying to get the capital punishment of Timothy McVeigh set aside. That doesn't mean that he wants Timothy McVeigh to go loose, but the Pope believes that life without parole, which is sometimes necessary, is uh, actually a greater punishment than capital punishment, and that it actually accomplishes exactly the same thing as capital punishment. So anyway, I'm just throwing that out as, as an issue that you can argue all different kinds of, of uh, sides to. Now, if you want to speak to that, go right ahead. If you want to bring up something else, then now's the time to do it. Okay, you want to start? Um, when I got the email that um, we were going to be talking on the justice system, I really started thinking about it a lot, and so last night I wrote this. I do not know how I should feel about the justice system. This is because of my own experience. In 1990, my friend Christy Chavier and I were only 15 years old. On February 2nd, Gary Wing Etheridge murdered her. I was supposed to be spending the night with her, but he went there to rob her mom so he could have more drug money, and he attacked her mother and her, and he did all kinds of bad things, and he was sentenced to death row. 
I'm still very upset at what he did, but I still don't see how his death will make things any better. Executing him won't change the past. I pray for him every day because I want him to be sorry for what he did and ask God's forgiveness. I want him to have a relationship with God, and I've told people that. I've also told him I feel sorry for him because in a way he ended his own life that night. <laughs> people have repeatedly told me that he's evil and he deserves to die. I don't know if I should agree. Because I think about it, and he's one of God's children and a sinner just like me and the rest of us. And I just hope he finds forgiveness before it's too late. Because <laughs> I'd really like to see, see, see him in heaven. <laughs> and I'm probably the only person who feels this way. But I've prayed a lot about it. I've spent a lot of sleepless nights thinking about it. And that's how I feel. <laughs> And I just can't help but feel that his execution won't take away his guilt, and it never will bring my friend Christy back. Well, you could see that uh, personal experience in these kinds of things uh, are uh, actually they're more widespread these days because of the uh, because of uh, that period. Actually, crime is now going down, but there was a period in which uh, it looked like it was going to completely get away from us. And uh, the fact that we see these things on TV all the time, in other words, we're put in touch with it, uh, makes it uh, makes it a very important thing on our front burner. When I was a child, uh, I think I only heard about one murder in my whole life uh, in our area. Well, you can't get away with that in Houston, you know. You, you, what, you, what you realize in Houston is that a lot of murders don't even make the newspaper because there's so many of them. And they are, they are definitely devastating to families. And, uh, but the question, one of the questions that's been brought up uh, is the question of forgiveness. And uh, that needs to be sorted out a little bit because... Um, even if you forgive someone, that doesn't necessarily mean that they should be on the street. You understand what I'm saying? Um, and so uh, sometimes people who are in favor of the death penalty assume that someone who is uh, trying to push forgiveness, for instance, there have been lots of people whose loved ones have been murdered, that these people under the impact of Christian ethics or some other kind of ethic have gone and actually made uh, made forgiving relationships with people who did it. But that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, that uh, that person should be let go as if he had not done anything. Uh, a few, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, a woman named Carla Faye Tucker was in was in state prison and uh, I was in Houston when she committed her murders and I remember the front pages and all of the blood and so forth she committed along with some other people some incredibly bloody and heinous murders because she was she uh, was so strung out on several different drugs that uh, there just wasn't any sense or compassion or anything else left in her and so uh, she was tried and convicted and given a capital sentence. Well, later she got sober <laughs> and underwent what she called and other people call a new birth experience and, uh, and uh, came into a relationship with Jesus. Well, now, first of all, um, I can't forgive Carla Fay for somebody else. <laughs> In other words, Somebody else has to do that forgiving. Somebody that's been hurt by her has to do the forgiving. But even forgiveness and even being born again should not necessarily in and of itself uh, uh, get rid of the possibility of punishment. And Carla Fay never asked to be let out of prison. All she asked was that in the light of her changed life, and in the light of the testimony of all the people, including all the prison guards and all of and the and the uh, uh, and the prison officials and 
and other folks that she be given a chance just to con just to live out her life um, in prison and be able to continue the good work she did. Well, that came to Governor Bush, and that came to the Texas Parole Board. And that is one of the events that really brought the nature of the Texas Parole Board to my attention. Because the Texas Parole Board are hired to do something which they never do. And that is consider the cases of people. In other words, it's legal for the Texas Parole Board to uh, commute somebody's sentence or to compute his death sentence. That's nothing illegal about that. Uh, but if they have no inclination to do it, and if, if evidently the reason why they were put on the parole board is because they showed that they had no inclination to do it, then uh, from my perspective, we need to get a new parole board or do something about that. And I don't think Carla Fay's sentence, sentence should have been commuted because she became a Christian. Uh, she certainly shouldn't have been let out of prison because she became a Christian. I think she could I think her case should have been commuted because the people in government should have been Christians they claim to be. In other words, uh, uh, if not Christians, at least people of humanity who realize that that the purpose for our prison system is to rehabilitate people. And if the only cases of rehabilitation are still, uh, ignored, then there's not much use for our system. Anyway, that's that's kind of my own personal reaction to that. Who who wants to talk now? Yeah. Um, well, throughout my life, I've been victim of several different types of violent crimes, and I'm only 18. And the people that <clears throat> did me wrong, I forgave them. And yet, like with me, with my baby's father, he assaulted me, and I feel that. Except I felt that if I was able to uh, drop charges that it would be okay, but the um, the DA tried to coach me into um, testifying, and they even threatened me with a subpoena of saying if I refuse to testify, I have something to hide and it can result in imprisonment, which I feel is unnecessary because I feel that if they incarcerate him for the assault, my child won't have a father. And then if he's incarcerated, because he's not, if he goes to jail for that, he won't be able to pay child support, and then they'll keep him in jail. And it's all because of some past offense that he was already tried upon. And I think after somebody has been placed in prison, has suffered a term for something they've done a long time ago, they shouldn't be constantly prosecuted, because that is still considered W jeopardy, but they do it all the time. And I think those people should be put in front of a jury themselves, especially the DAs. And I felt like I should have reported that DA, but he he has the upper hand in this situation, but I wouldn't I wouldn't know what to say. I know other people have opinions, and I would like an opinion because I need some counseling of, upon this. This is, it doesn't make any sense about what they're trying to do. It doesn't make sense at all. Well, that's interesting that you would uh, want to drop charges against somebody that assaulted you. I don't know what the context of it is, but. Uh, um, I do think that uh, in that area, we need to do a lot of looking into it, uh, especially in the area of, uh, of uh, what is called statutory rape. Because, for instance, there was a young man from Mexico in uh, Houston a while back who, um, who, uh, got, uh, who got married, kind of, to... Uh, not not officially, but got married to a uh, young girl who was also a uh, uh, non-citizen in America. And I think uh, she was 15 or something like that, which is something that would have happened all the time, you know, where he came from. So it wasn't under the, uh, it wasn't under the, uh, uh, it wasn't in the intent of assaulting anybody or causing anybody any problem. And I think that I think that our judges should always have more um, leeway in trying to determine things like this. One of the most horrible cases in the state of Texas, which is still hasn't been resolved, and I would like to see somebody write a book on it, but I don't know that they have. There was a couple, um, uh, uh, an immigrant couple uh, from Eastern Europe, I forget which country, 
and uh, they were at a football game and the father put his hand on his daughter in a way that people in that country do all the time but the people surrounding them thought that that looked a little bit suspicious so they called the uh, child protective agency all of their children were taken away from them put into foster homes and uh, once the couple uh, went to trial and proved that uh, his action is not did not consist uh, did not uh, consist of child abuse then he went back to try to get his children and he still has not got them yet because they were bi they were given to another foster home and the judge has ruled that uh, since they've been in that other foster home then that they were they don't belong to the couple anymore there are lots of cases like that one of the one of the areas of criminal justice that uh, that I have some of the most problems with is with child uh, child protective not because we don't need child protective we definitely need child protective agencies but at the same time we don't need any kind of agencies or institutions who um, who do not um, take, in, take into consideration the justice of what they're doing. They just talk about, you know, following the law. And uh, I think that some, some things are going to change in that direction. But uh, one of the important things about a criminal justice system, I think, is that mercy is actually supposedly written into American law. And uh, and so judges sometimes have the uh, have the uh, right to extend mercy, which in some cases is the extension of justice. All right, who else wants to? Yes. I think one of the largest problems we have with um, the penal system is that it makes too much money, and it's not <clears throat> conducive to those organizations who are making money off of the penal system to work any other way than what it is working. So as long as it's a money-making organization and not one that is for rehabilitation purposes, they're not going to care or even try and see that justice is dealt to those individuals who are taken, um, who may be arrested and, and sent to trial. I mean, there are several issues or several cases that um, I was listening to a radio program and um, there was a young African-American man that was uh, on there talking to Rodney Ellis and he was saying that because he didn't have the money for legal representation, he was appointed an attorney. And you have all of these public defenders who are overworked, they're underpaid, and their thing is plea bargain. They don't ask them whether or not they actually did the crime, if they're guilty or innocent, but your best bet is to plea bargain. So if that person doesn't have enough confidence in themselves or doesn't have that support system as far as the family is concerned, you have a lot of people that get caught up in the legal system that way. They don't have any other out. They don't have any other options they don't have the financial um, backing to have their own legal representation, somebody who is going to fight for them. Because we know that it's not innocent until proven guilty. You're guilty, and then you have to prove that you're innocent. Well, as I said in the beginning, in my beginning remarks, one of the chief considerations having to do with the application of Christian ethics or any good ethic to any system is the power of money. Uh, money has power in all cultures. It has power in all uh, criminal justice systems. And uh, uh, our problem, I think our problem in America is, is, uh, is that um, a, a great many people still assume that, that money doesn't have power. Or they assume that money does have power, but it's none of their business. You know? And so that's, that's part of the problem. Uh, 
there, there are not many people who make money off of the uh, criminal justice system or off the prison system, but those that do probably make pretty good money. The, uh, one of the problems is that the uh, guards don't make much, very much money. And so it's hard to get guards who are uh, well-trained and sensitive and, uh, and uh, uh, do what they're supposed to do. Uh, another problem with the money situation is that our state legislature is very happy to allocate money for building prisons. In fact, uh, the last budget, I think, allocated $8 million for building, oh, I forget how much money it was, but uh, millions of dollars for building another uh, prison which would hold uh, so many inmates. And... Uh, which means that the, uh, it's going to cost more to keep those people in prison than it is to pay the guards that keep them or to uh, send them to Harvard University or, or to give them drug treatment or whatever it is. In other words, if they, would, if they would, from my perspective, spend all those millions of dollars in trying to deal with these people when they first enter the criminal justice system instead of just building places to put them, uh, that would be very helpful. Yes. Um, it's kind of off the subject, but it's about um, law enforcement. I feel that um, sometimes when they kill innocent people, they should be prosecuted as well, and they get off so easily. I mean, it's it's still your. It's not really. Um, <clears throat> They make it more than what it is because it's still their occupation, regardless if they were a construction worker or a. Um, police officer, if they pull a gun on somebody that has no weapon to defend themselves and they shoot them, they are they should be held responsible, and a lot of them are not held responsible. And that brought my, that I, I really thought about that, but it came back to my attention when they had the riot in Cincinnati, and I feel that those those police officers should be prosecuted because for some reason a lot of them were guilty of racial profiling and they had a history of it, and they had a history of shooting shooting first and asking questions later so they just looking at their history that was trying to be hidden from the public and caused the riot they should look at that when it comes down to um, um armed enforcement because a lot of them are prosecuting i mean a lot of them are racial profiling and shooting because they feel that it's not necessary to put them in jail because they're treated like animals and they it was one that actually said that um, that was on Queen Latifah, and he confessed that um, s racial profiling is just like um, looking for a dog with rabies. Though the dog may not have rabies, because his teeth are sharp, they put him to sleep. And I feel that that's how they're doing with law enforcement as well. Well, that is, uh, that's a continuing problem in the United States. Sometimes... Uh, these problems are so prominent, in fact, on TV that we probably don't realize that uh, that uh, in some ways, in some places, it's getting better. Before before TV, these things would happen, and nobody would ever hear anything about it. And uh, so, at least uh, uh, the media and other kinds of of uh, people are actually picking up on these things and doing something about it. For instance, there's there's now a group uh, made up of very good and uh, well-financed lawyers who are now making it possible for everybody on death row probably eventually to be able to get DNA evidence checked out. Um, so there are little um, points of light here and there. There's also the problem that we need to understand that uh, Christian ethics does, never expects to be 100% effective. There's, not, there's never going to be 100% justice in anybody's system. So uh, uh, no ethical system should uh, assume that's going to happen. But no, no ethic should uh, assume that since there's never going to be 100% justice, we should stop the fight or we should, we, should, uh, we should hold back on the fight because the fight still goes on. And uh, law enforcement uh, is made up of human beings just like ev every other job. And sometimes law enforcement is made up of human beings who are attracted to the job because of 
the macho image that it has and so forth. And so that, that needs to be educated out of our law enforcement. And, uh, but, but often we elect, uh, we elect district attorneys because of their macho image and because of their uh, assumption that their job is to make sure somebody goes to prison. And it seems to me like that in a just society, that should not be the job of a district attorney. The job of the district attorney should be in some way to make sure that if he finds problems with his case, that he doesn't, uh, his, his job is not dependent upon him putting, putting himself or putting somebody in prison. Yes? Well, I mean, I certainly understand the discussion we're having, but to some, I mean, I have a bit of a problem with it to some extent because the ends of Christian ethics and our justice system are so different. I mean, the end of the justice system is presumably justice. The end of Christian ethics is, in fact, injustice. I mean, you treat people not how they deserve to be treated, but, you know, how you're called to treat them. You don't not forgive someone. You forgive them seven times, 70 times. So, obviously, that kind of ethic can't completely inform the justice system. It's, it's futile. But, I mean, I wonder where we draw the line of, of what kind of ethic we expect our government officials to have without you know, religious interference or, or you know, that sort of, I mean, they seem so incongruous to me. Well, uh, the government should have no right to uh, protection from religious interference. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the, uh, what you've stated is actually absolutely correct. That's what, that's one of the points Ramsey makes. That's one of the points of my reading this, these two paragraphs in the beginning, and that is, Christian ethics is a strategy, and uh, you cannot you cannot go into Washington D.C. and make Christian ethics the law of the land because that doesn't that doesn't work. But Christian ethics as a strategy should also make common cause with certain tactics. In other words, if some of the things that we've uh, brought up this morning may not be accurate. But if they're accurate, then it has to do with justice. And from the perspective of Christian ethics, uh, a, a, um, a law should at least be just. It cannot go on, as we said before, and let somebody out of prison or to, or to revoke the punishment. Uh, that's not, uh, Christian ethics can't do that. Uh, in, the, um, in the New Testament, Paul says that the that the government does not carry the sword in vain. In other words, uh, uh, even Christians should be under law that uh, if they break, then they should accept the punishment. That's even true even if they're doing something that is just. For instance, uh, uh, pacifists, some Christians are pacifists, which means that they cannot conscientiously participate in, uh, in a war in any way. Well, uh, because of the witness of these people in America, American laws on pacifism are very different from what they used to be. In other words, American laws make allowance for the fact that there are some people who are absolute pacifists. Uh, but on the other hand, American laws can't just completely absolve people of, uh, of not participating in the culture. So if somebody is going to be a pacifist, they should at least be Christian enough to accept the penalties that are still provided in this country for their actions. Uh, if you're going to be a civil rights activist, like Martin Luther King, he understood that he understood that he had to accept the penalties, whatever they were, for his action. Uh, because he was he was uh, acting against unjust laws. And if you're acting against unjust laws, what are you doing? You're breaking the law. But what you need to understand is that most injustice is legal. So uh, you, cannot, you cannot just translate Christian love into law. If you do that, then of course uh, uh, you, there's no reason for a law court. There's no reason for prosecution. There's no reason for law enforcement. So Christian ethics cannot, is not utopian. That's what 
Ramsey and other people mean when they say Christian ethics is not utopian. It recognizes that there are some people who need to be kept off the street. There are some people who uh, need to be protected from the actions of other people. It's just that um, it's just that we could possibly develop a culture of law enforcement in which the right people are kept off the streets and the, and, the, and the people who should not be kept off the streets are allowed to be on the streets and the people who should not be prosecuted for something should not be prosecuted for it and so forth. In other words, you're right that the, the, as far as Christian ethics can go in law enforcement is in terms of justice. But uh, justice cannot be totally separated in Christian ethics from love. Otherwise, uh, uh, anything that's legal would be considered just. And Christian ethics consider, does not consider anything legal to be just. One thing I want to say is that it seems like what she was saying, and you know, a problem I see with the justice system is it seems that police and judges, all these people have power, and it's kind of like a very strong power. And I observe that a lot of them aren't Christian. Some people, like I know some police have the attitude, well, you know, the criminals aren't Christian, or they don't act, you know, out of God's love, so why should I, you know? And so, like, who's going to keep an eye on the police and the justice system to make sure that they're just, you know? I mean, they're supposed to be keeping an eye on us, but who keeps an eye on them? Well, in a, uh, in a democracy, of course, that's supposed to be, uh, um, there's supposed to be checks and balances. That's the whole, and, uh, and the concept of checks and balances came out of Christian ethic. That doesn't mean that, uh, that our laws are necessarily Christian, but it does mean that uh, we've built into our laws the possibility that they may be misused. And uh, that's especially true when you're dealing with uh, a bureaucratic institution. That's true whether you're dealing with a bureaucratic institution, which is a, which is a political institution or a uh, legal institution, or whether you're dealing with a bureaucratic institution that is uh, not connected with the state at all, a private institution. Uh, we've, got to, uh, we've got to protect ourselves from our own bureaucracies. We've got to protect ourselves from our own institutions. For instance, one private institution that is, that is very widespread in Houston is one that's very needed. That is uh, retire, uh, homes for elderly people. But homes for elderly people, if they're not supervised by people with compassion and, uh, and a, a sense of justice and love, can just mistreat people. And they do it all the time. And so you've got to keep your eye on them. And uh, so that, that means that what we're talking about is the strategy of Christian love, but the tactics may be uh, various different ways. You know, one of the tactics is to go to Marvin Zindler, you know, <laughs> or, or, or Dwayne Dolcefino or somebody like that. That's one of the tactics. But we shouldn't be, depend on Marvin Zindler to keep our... Uh, elderly homes honest. That should be part of our whole uh, our whole society. I think um, it all stems back to the fact that you have people that are employed in these facilities that are making basically minimum wage mm -hmm. um, salaries and you can't well, like the saying goes, you get what you pay for. So if you expect to have people who are compassionate and who are educated and who have that sense of duty toward that group, then you're going to have to dish out the dollars. And it's the same thing with the penal system. Like you were saying before, you have these guards that are being um, paid maybe $10 an hour or something like that to basically put their lives on the line with people in a prison system. And they're not going to risk their life or even try and be compassionate towards somebody. I mean, their, their thing is, I'm here to make money, to get my check, and that's it. I'm not here to try and help anybody. 
You remember when we talked about the Old Testament, the Old Testament conception of God, that is, Jewish and Christian, Christian ethics comes out of their conception of God, whatever is the character of God. And one of the, the chief characters of the God of the Old Testament is that he is the defender of the weak, he is the defender of the poor, he is the defender of the widows and the orphans and so forth. Uh, now that might translate in a different way into, uh, into American society. For instance, uh, if you did not take care of your old people in the, uh, <laughs> under the law of Moses, uh, there, there really wasn't much of a problem with that because uh, if you mistreated your uh, parents, you, you got the death penalty yourself. But in American society, that's not, uh, we don't have many uh, laws in that regard. And so what I'm saying is that um, we can allow our society to be, to be supervised by the marketplace. We can allow our society to be supervised by capitalism or by money or by or by financial bureaucracies, or government bureaucracies. Um, and uh, Christians may just kind of sit back, or any ethical person might just kind of sit back and say, well, it's too big for me, you can't fight City Hall. And that means that they have, they have uh, um, given up on their ethical responsibility. And uh, I think, I think, Ethics involves all of these things, not just in the criminal justice system, but in other places. We, we pay our teachers. Uh, we don't pay our teachers enough to, uh, to uh, attract sometimes uh, always the best people to teach our children, and yet we get up and say that's the most important thing in our society. Well, what you need to find out is, is uh, what does the society really consider to be the most important thing? And the most important institutions in our society are Microsoft, uh, Exxon, and so on. Now, there's nothing particularly wrong with, with these business being in business. As they say, some of my best friends are president of Exxon. But, <laughs> but, uh, but you can't just allow people in these giant private or public bureaucracies to um, have their own way because after all they are uh, especially in a public bureaucracy they're supposed to be our employees they're supposed to be our we're the ones that are supposed to pay them and we're the ones that are supposed to give them uh, support so we need to pay them well and we need to educate them well and we need to train them well otherwise we're going to be sitting in our home and some, one of these bureaucracies is going to descend on us and treat us unjustly and there's nothing we can do about it. Um, I disagree because if you're going to work with the elderly, you need to have patience. Pay should not be the reason for your compassion because then you're not compassionate at all. You're, you cannot be paid for emotion because emotions are natural. If you're going to work with children and and you know you're going to beat the children to death and you don't even like your own children, you should not work in that environment because it doesn't matter how much money you get paid, you're still going to have that attitude of, I'll never get paid enough. Money does not justify abuse and mistreatment, um, neither does education. You don't have to be educated to be compassionate. And I feel that that's just an excuse to let people get away with inhumane things. If you are a teacher and you know you don't like children, then you need not to be a teacher because that's just an excuse for you to yell and mistreat them. And regardless of pay, I don't care, they, that's an excuse because if there was no such thing as money, God would still hold you responsible for your actions and that's the action that's to be held responsible. Yeah, I don't know that there's disagreement on that. In other words, uh, uh, the, uh, the whole the whole goal is to is to try to make sure that the people who are taking care of the elderly are compassionate, and uh, uh, but at the same time, um, justice requires that people who are doing this kind of work for us um, should also be treated right. In other words, it's a it's a it's a double edged thing. It's not just uh, and the same thing was tr true with policemen. Uh, there is no justice, uh, there's no justification for, for what some policemen do. And so they should be held accountable for it. 
But on the other end of the spectrum is our responsibility to try to make sure that we don't have any policemen who are not compassionate and who, we don't have any policemen who are not well trained. Because there's still going to be enough injustice as there is. If we're not paying attention to these institutions, then there will be injustice all over the place. Who wants to talk? <laughs> hmm? Anybody else want to say something? Well, as I said, uh, um, this personally is a very important issue to me because I've had so many dealings with different people who are uh, who've gotten involved in the criminal justice system, and uh, uh, it is uh, an enraging thing to see people. Uh, treated as though they're just kind of ciphers or numbers and uh, not cre treated as human beings. There are people in Houston, I'm, I've dealt, for instance, with people in Houston who uh, um, have gone to visit somebody in uh, jail and uh, they got into the jail And they signed in, and they were promptly arrested. And they were put in the jail, and this just happened to be on a Sunday, so uh, there wasn't going to be any uh, looking at the situation until for, for more than 28 hour, 24 hours, in fact, almost 48 hours. And uh, when it was finally looked into, it was discovered that there was, that there was no legal reason for arresting that person and putting them in jail. But uh, when, when she was let out, you know, <laughs> there was no apology, there was no, uh, there was no uh, uh, indication that anything particularly bad had taken place. She was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And there are people there are lots of people in Houston who are arrested like this. Or they are arrested for very minor offenses, misdemeanors. And, uh, and when you get arrested and taken into a jail and you get, uh, you get uh, strip searched and you get booked, um, that's a very humiliating experience. And that's, uh, that's one of the things that we need, I think, to work on. Because the problem is, there are a number of people who experience this, but not a number to make any difference in the newspaper. You understand what I'm saying? So when you finally experience it, which you may do one of these days, you're going to be all by yourself. Because nobody is keeping an eye on this kind of thing. Nobody is even concerned about this kind of thing. Because Americans, and Texans particularly, just kind of assume that if a policeman is going to arrest you, you deserve it. And that just isn't necessarily so. I know um, now they're in the process of trying to, um, I guess, update a bill that was passed for restitution for people who were um, wrongfully incarcerated. Because I think at, at this time, you have to have been in jail for several years yeah. in order for them to pay restitution to you and the maximum amount that you can receive is $25,000. I think you have to have been in jail for 10 years and the maximum amount um, that you can get is $25,000. So that tells you as an individual that you're not worth much. and. I think the restitution should be fair in accordance to what, you know, that person lost. I mean, you can't pay them for the number of years that they have been denied, but, I mean, it, it's kind of uh, disturbing to know that they can take, take away your life and then... Well, that's another illustration of the fact that money talks. And, uh, and 
from my perspective, somebody who has spent 10 years or 15 years on death row uh, because of an overzealous prosecutor or because uh, there, wasn't, uh, there wasn't enough investigation, uh, he should be well compensated. But from my perspective, money talks so much that even someone who is arrested uh, and just spends 24 hours in jail should be comp uh, compensated. Otherwise, there is no, uh, there's no burden on people who uh, do this to quit doing it. It's just like, uh, how are you going to get people to quit polluting? Well, it's got to cost them. They can pay fines that will, that will keep them in business for another 10 years, but it's got to cost them in order to stop polluting. All right, I thank you for your participation and for your discussion, and good luck. <laughs>